Hello and welcome to another edition of the Paranormal Concept Show. I'm your host, Paul Rook, and as always, we are joined by the stupendous Kerry Greenaway. And tonight, Richard's not joining us tonight. No, unfortunately not. Um, this whole situation is, is causing a bit of a problem for our Richard in regards to his mental health. Um, he's not embarrassed to admit that. It's a common problem at the moment for a lot of people. So we would just like to say out there, don't forget, you are not alone. Reach out, talk to people, get the help you need if you need it. This whole COVID lockdown situation is incredibly traumatic and impactful on people's mental well-being. So please, 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 please reach out and talk to the people that you need to talk to. Um, and we wish Richard all the best. And obviously, Paul and I are supporting him in the background as well. So, yeah, Richard, are we up back? We're we missing you already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can't it just seems different not sort of introducing him to the show? <laughs> I know it does feel like we've missed part of our, our third wheel, as it were. It, it's very yeah. weird, but we'll persevere. Third wheel's and... fallen off. We'll have to go and pick it up later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Particularly as tonight's show is going to be one of the subjects that he really does um, or really wanted to be involved in. It, it's such a shame because. Um, we're, we're continuing, really, um, off the back of the Barry Strom show, because on that show, um, as, as you all know, we channeled certain famous people throughout history. And at the end, the final message was given um, by, allegedly, Jesus to us. Um, so that yeah. led us down a rabbit hole of um, thinking about, actually, religion and the paranormal together. Um, that that's sort of where we went with that because we've covered this in other shows when we've talked about stigmata and holy rec- relics and things like that. Um, and there is a tie. So we was looking around and it's actually quite a big topic um, looking at the Bible and the paranormal and it, we felt very out of our depths. Yeah, and it gave us a bit of a headache, didn't it? <laughs> a little bit, a little bit of one because trying to understand some of scripture when you're not knowing scripture (laughs) quite frankly is it's just like a bit of a mind blow kind of thing but we came across a website now the website is ghost schools and gods and the guy that writes on this is just phenomenal go check the website out we'll share the link to the paranormal concept facebook page for you guys to go and check it out now this this gentleman he's got a distinction grade of master of arts and he was a prize winning dissertation on this one this isn't just like a little thing this is quite a big deal right this is in in the name of it was the paranormal hauntings and application in deliverance ministry this is honestly we've got an academic for you guys (laughs) that's what we've got we want to welcome matt arnold to the show good evening Good evening. Thank you. Um, I hope I live up to the bigging up on that one. Well, just looking at your website, you, you, you certainly are going to. <laughs> because what you do, you know, you know the scriptures inside out, really, don't you? Uh, I wouldn't say inside out. I'm still learning. It's a lifelong journey through it. It's a big book. It is a big book. Now, before we get any, I always believed, and I'm, I know I'm wrong, since I've learned since but I always believed that the Bible was basically written by a con- collaboration of different leaders under the Roman Emperor of Constantine but that's not true is it no no I mean it's been written over about 1600 years by about 40 different authors spanning quite a few different countries uh, majorly around the ancient Near East um, so you're talking quite an extensive authorship you certainly are and so where did that myth it's a myth isn't it that this this happened it's almost like you're going um you know everyone seems to believe that he got all like different leaders from different denominations together and wrote it down but but it wasn't it was just basically deciding which scriptures would enter the bible but that had actually nothing really to do with him it was just it happened while he was emperor Yeah, I mean, you've got various um, what's called synods where people came together and looked at the various scriptures, the various books and went, yeah, we can think that that one's written by the original author or that one's got provenance um, around that particular time. And they went through a fairly rigorous sifting process of whether or not a book would be classed as canonical and 
whether it would be classed as pseudepigraphal, um, which is uh, books that are purportedly written by an author, but we're pretty sure that they weren't written by an author. But the odd thing is that some of the books that we think are written by various people that managed to get in canon, we now think probably weren't written by them anyway. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, it's a whole mixed bag, really. (laughs) uh, As we work our way through archaeological research and stuff, we... We're realising more and more that uh, what we thought we know, we don't know. So we're having to reassess stuff. But um, I'm saying that the canon of Scripture, there are seven canons of Scripture for the whole universal church. So you've got books that are in, say, the Roman Catholic canon that aren't in the Western Protestant canon. You've got books in the Ethiopian and the Eritrean canons that aren't in either of the, the Catholic or the Protestant so uh, you just have to look through it and test everything, sift it and say, well, I think I can go down on this one and say, yeah, I'm happy with that being in there. But the more that we're discovering in archaeology, the more we're realizing that what we nailed down was pretty much like nailing jelly to a wall. Um, <laughs> books were used uh, in the times of Jesus that certain Protestants wouldn't use now. Mm. Um, uh, for instance, one Enoch and the apocryphal books. Okay. Now, a lot of the, the, the stories uh, initiated were verbal, weren't they? They, they were verbalised to each other before they even got written down into um, some form of scripture. So, again, you've got that that evolution of tale um, from verbal tellings before they got written down. Um, mm-hmm. So it becomes, it becomes, and I've used this analogy quite recently, a chimera of different perspectives and belief systems and opinions based on something that possibly could have happened way back in then, but it doesn't change the tales and the story and the meaning behind it. But it's for us to now in our modern times to interpret that. Mm-hmm. I mean... We've got to realise that the Bible wasn't written to us, modern 21st century people. It was written to people, as I said, thousands of years ago, in their cultures, using imagery that was in their culture, um, with their cultural mindset, and all of the baggage that went with that. So, you know, it cannot be written to a 21st century person to explain the origins of the universe, Um talking about quantum mechanics and things like that when you know okay they were pretty intelligent people building pyramids and that but quantum mechanics trying to explain it back then just it was a no-goer so the revelation that came through these people through the writers would have been through their own personalities through their own um, ideas about how things came to be but that doesn't necessarily as you say mean that it doesn't have any application for us today it, was written for humankind uh, whatever age that we're living in and we can still find the bits in there that are incredibly useful for life today and with so it's down to like interpretation then isn't it and um, yes i mean yeah. you've got to you've got to try and get the best way that you can interpret scripture is by finding out what did the original author mean um and that comes with finding the archaeological evidence of surrounding cultures and the culture itself um, so that we can find out what the words meant to those first listeners and writers. It's uh, Within itself, it really is, uh, regardless of belief system, or, uh, you know, obviously the whole thing is a belief system driven um, piece of work, but within that, there are incredible tales of phenomena that nowadays would come under the paranormal banner mm-hmm. miracles yes, that were, you know miracles that happened um one of the main things god is supposed to have said was don't talk to spirit basically don't interact there you shouldn't be doing that and yet now and oh, now, i disagree oh right okay but there, but there Ex- we go carry on explain no explain that point to me because that's again a, maybe a myth that we've all <laughs> taken from it taken I, from I, it I, Yes, it is a myth. Um, right, where do we start? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to sit back and let you go now. <laughs> okay, um, 
there's no command not to actually engage. There's the command not to initiate contact. Oh. Um, okay, but there is the command to test the spirits uh, because not all come from God. Um, so therefore, in order to test them, you have to listen to what they've got to say. And that requires communication. So therefore, what I would say is, don't go trying to stir stuff up. But if stuff is already disturbed, then listen and engage, but test what comes through. But then that, in this day and age, that's quite a worrying thing because there's a lot of people out there going out and deliberately initiating or trying to initiate contact, isn't there? Yep. So yep. Is, is, and carry on. I would, but I, I basically say, just be very careful what you're doing because, firstly, if you are engaging with spirits of the dead, they're not there for entertainment purposes, just as a normal enfleshed person would be. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not there for your entertainment. Uh, they don't dance. They don't whistle when you say "whistle to me" or things like that. Um, and some of these people might be hurting still. So therefore, you know, for us to go and start stirring stuff up is dishonouring to them, I think, would be the best way of saying it. Yeah, because there are a lot of people that do investigations and they do tend to, um, you know, a lot lot of people that I know do it respectfully. You know, they Mm. ask the spirit to come to them, Mm. you know. um, But as you said, it's, it's initiating that that communication isn't it really yeah and i mean you've got the the dead who are resting in peace Mm -hmm. but you've also got you've also got the unquiet dead who are disturbed for some reason and that is what i see as a purpose that we can have in trying to lay to rest those spirits that are (sighs) unquiet Mm. yeah that's almost like a human responsibility isn't it to prevent hurt to each other we sh- mm-hmm. that's what we should be living by we don't um generally you know we see unfortunate um consequences of actions all over the place um but our goal should be to try and not hurt people and work in kindness towards people um unfortunately that's a lesson that that very uh, few they, they look internal rather than external influence and and Anyway, that's a whole different theological discussion, isn't it? Um, so let's get yep. back to this. So in regard to ghosts of people, mm-hmm. why would they want to hang around if, if God or um, the higher realms are there ready to receive? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just, it, I'll tell you when I get on the other side and you join me. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, there are occasional instances where um, there have been people like C.S. Lewis, um, the writer of the Narnia Chronicles and many, many other theological tomes, um, who actually came twice and appeared to J.B. Phillips, who was working on a Bible translation. And uh, J.B. Phillips, in his foreword, gives thanks to C.S. Lewis for his encouragement, which seems to be a little bit coded messages to... Mm, yeah, I actually had a posthumous couple of appearances of C.S. Lewis to me. So there's encouragement. Um, but then you've got other stuff as well, restless souls and all that sort of stuff, things, jobs to do. I mean, this this whole concept of going to heaven when you die, or downstairs, as it were, um, <laughs> which really is just a modern thing. Back in the old days, uh, the early church, it was actually classed as a heresy that you went to heaven when you died. Um, it was a Gnostic, from the old ancient Gnostic uh, teachings, that you, you went to heaven when you died. Um, there was the whole belief system of the afterlife, Sheol or Hades, um, where everybody went, good, bad, indifferent. And so therefore, you had a life that was not sitting around and sleeping, which is an invention that Luther promoted back in the days of the Reformation when he got rid of purgatory and had to then give account for why there were things like poltergeists and restless spirits and things. So he just basically said, oh, well, they're all demons because they can't be human spirits because purgatory doesn't exist, does it? 
I mean, I don't believe in purgatory myself, but I believe that there is an afterlife realm that people are in where they work out, they continue to work out their salvation, as the Bible says. And that belief system of, of heaven, hell and purgatory comes from very early days of Dante, though, doesn't it? That's where our modern day perception still kind of sits, really. And we have that. A, a lot of. Mm. Sorry, go on. No, you carry on. A, a lot of uh, perceptions that we have of hell and heaven do indeed come from Dante or Milton. Um, and people have taken those as almost the 67th book of the Bible. Mm. And what people come out with and say talk about when they talk about heaven and hell is actually milton-esque or dante-esque and we need to so we need to sort of like get rid of that that um theology within our brains ourselves really that there is no separation between any of that really it's it's an um, an evolution of soul rather than a judgment of soul that hasn't happened yet right well Kind of, yes and no. I mean, the, the Milton and Dante-esque stuff is definitely an evolution of the afterlife belief systems. But these go back to 300 BC before then, where in the ancient Hebrew, Hebraic writings, you would have an idea of Sheol where everybody went, uh, and it was a s- sort of a grey, shady place where the shades lived. Uh, and life there was not a patch on the colour of life in the flesh. And then as you get towards the time of the Maccabees and the Maccabean revolt, you, you get these Jews going, hold on a second, this isn't right. We've got our brave Jewish warriors who are dying in battle, going to the same places as these heathen Gentiles. What's going on? We've got to have some sort of separation here. Um, and there's then that development of a segregation within Sheol, where when you get to sort of the writings of one Enoch, you have four compartments within the afterlife, including paradise. And um, you've got places like Tartarus, where the rebellious angels that fell um, back in Genesis 6 uh, and one Enoch 1 to 36 uh, are held. There talks about in Jude and 2 Peter. Um, but then you've also um, got another development where when you get to Jesus' time, and he talks about the rich man Lazarus, he talks about at least two compartments. Um, and so there are some there that talk about Hades, where the rich man is, and Lazarus is in uh, by Abraham's bosom, which is paradise. And then you've got the thief on the cross who uh, repents, and you've got Jesus telling him, today you'll be with me in paradise. So... You've got these different compartments within the afterlife, which would make sense if everybody goes to Hades or Sheol, Mm. which is the Hebrew version of it. Um, But then you get to, say, the King James, the Wycliffe translation of the Bible, um, where hell was used as a a catch-all word for Gehenna, um, which is a fiery place, Tartarus, which is the prison place, and then... um, Hades. So Hades, Gehenna and Tartarus were all wrapped up in this word called hell, which was given the impression by Milton and uh, Dante. So, yeah, it's all a bit of a mess, really, how it's developed. But again, it's human personifications, isn't it, of theories or theologies, should I say. And that's something we should be aware of, really, because no matter what our own personal belief system is, we have to be aware that these writings and stuff have actually been done by humans at some point. Yeah, I mean, you've got the, the whole concept of inspira- inspired writing, where the writing has been inspired by the creator himself, or herself, or it's genderless. <laughs> gender, gender. I don't use the word genderless, I use the word genderful for the uh, divine okay. creator. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've got that inspiration there that you would be expected to to get so people are being given glimpses of what it's like uh in the afterlife um through this and then when we get to today's world we've got a ton of equipment to bring people back from pretty much what would be considered the dead uh with near-death experience stuff actual death experience stuff out-of-body experience all of that stuff some of which is actually in the bible but we just kind of don't really call it that because that those terms weren't invented 2,000 years ago. 
so, people. so it is essentially basically that um, obviously you've got bits that are um, you you have evidence for so like Jesus existing um, mm-hmm. even if just even if he just had to be uh, managed to be like a I don't know some sort of mage or something um, but when it comes to heaven and hell and it, it's sort of it's almost like they they've just sort of made it up. Is that, um, I wouldn't say they make it up anyway. In, in any way that no, but like, like an example, MGE would say they made it up. No, I would like, say it's like, almost like based on personal it, experience. They've experienced yeah. something in the same way as we have a personal experience in regards to I don't know um, a near death experience or out of body experience or even a spirit. Um, no, I'm talking in the in the respect of that. Like example, for example, um, with the Jews when they were like with our warriors, we need an extra like level, as it were. So <laughs> yes, like, I see what you mean there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that that's what I mean. It's like some of it is sort of made up. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily made up. I would say understood better. Um, things that happen like that, where there's a lot of death, it causes people to reevaluate what is, what do I believe, yeah. and to really sit down and think. How does this actually make sense in the world that I'm living in? Um, so therefore, I wouldn't say necessarily made it up so much as worked it out. Mm. Well, let's talk a little bit more about um, the best known person in the Bible, the one that we, we always refer to and talk to and who we allegedly spoke to last week, uh, not last week, the week before. Um, Jesus. L- let's talk Jesus. Now, do okay. we have proof, actual physical proof, as it were, that he existed as a person? We've got writings by people like Josephus who talks about um, Jesus being um, more than just a human being, um, if it was not blasphemous to say so. Um, we've, I think I've just read an article on um, some writing that has been discovered about Jesus, son of Mary. So... The fact that you've got 20,000 documented pieces of evidence um, that mention Jesus, you know, spanning across this whole thing, um, I would say is pretty conclusive that he existed in the same way as we believe that Julius Caesar existed, um, Mm. even though there's actually less evidence that Caesar did exist. Um, You've got people who are writing stuff down about the life of Jesus, um, within 15, 20 years of his death. So, you know, you have got first-hand eyewitness account material. And from a historical perspective, um, you'd you'd be strained to find an academic historian who would definitely say that Jesus didn't exist. Okay. The, The person that was Jesus was incredibly influential um beyond his time quite mm-hmm. frankly um and so we're talking today about him exactly he's never gone away has he he's like the most famous person in the world still to this day after you know thousands and thousands of years since he was on on this earth giving his influence came from very very humble beginnings but even in pre-beginning his conception was a miracle it, it's something that Nowadays, you could look at that and go, yeah, Mary played away, you know, naughty Mary. But it's a miracle in itself, isn't it? The Immaculate Conception. Yeah. I mean, there are some that say, well, okay, maybe it was Parthogenesis, um, where maybe somehow Mary's cell got impregnated by Mary's cell or something, you know, some of Mary's DNA managed to get inside the egg, whatever the, the mechanics of Parthogenesis are problem is with parthenogenesis it actually produces a clone um so jesus would have been female uh, doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> um, so so that that theory is dead in the water really um as to mary playing away I, why um yeah teenagers do that sort of stuff um but to be honest to be able to carry that story so well um when everybody else knows, you know, oh, that didn't really happen. You know, when, when somebody in our village say would say, oh, yeah, I became pregnant and it was a virgin conception, we're like, I don't think so. Um, 
And so therefore, back then, they would have been still thinking the same sort of stuff. But um, they would have had people who would have been able to test this sort of thing as they they used to do in medieval times. And, you know, so tests do exist for virginity. So, <clears throat> you know, it's uh, it's a bit graphic to go into the details, but you and I know what, what that means. Well, this, um, this is so true. So it could have been easily disproven. It could have been easily disproven. And that then would have been dead in the water right back at the very beginning. And, and Josie but, probably would have gone, no, I'm not going to marry her. <laughs> I'm not going to marry her. Well, he, he <laughs> anyway. had it in his mind that he, he, he thought at one point that she'd been playing away. And he had in mind secretly to divorce her. Um, because at that point in time, the way that marriage worked was, you're pretty much married um, in all but the, the consummation side of things. So, you know, for him to, for, to go that far, it would have required a miracle for him not to have done it. And he had an angel appear to him and basically tell him, this is what's going on, don't worry, uh, all will be well, pretty mm -hmm. much. And that in itself is another paranormal phenomena. We've got two right there. Mm -hmm. You know, an angel yeah. appears to Joseph and tells him it's all going to be well. Uh, and that could lead us down a whole different rabbit hole. But let's just stay on the Jesus um, theme for now, because throughout his life, his words spread like wildfire. He had followers, you know, everywhere he went, he was surrounded by people wanting to heal him, uh, him to heal them, sorry. Um, many, many stories surrounding Jesus of paranormal phenomena, even when you look at the passion um, of his death and, and the, the lengths, the mental strength of him comes through. When I read that, I don't see um, a son of God or the God's perspective of that. I see a man under immense mm -hmm. pressure, psychological mm -hmm. and physical um, distress, but mentally he is so strong in his belief mm. and his m mental capacity. Now, that in itself is a lesson, isn't it? To, to hold your own, to be true to yourself, to be self-authentic um, and against all external obstruction, I would say. It, mm -hmm. it, that in itself is a paranormal feat of, of extraordinary measures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... One of the things within Christianity is what's called the uh, the Christ-centered self-definition, um, whereby you know who you are. So, I am a child of God. I'm made in the made as an imager of God. I am God's ambassador on earth. Um, but I'm also who. So I know who I am, but I also know whose I am. I am God's. The whole story of Jesus itself, although it's actually quite a small part, isn't it, of the Bible? Relatively. Yeah, well, <laughs> it depends on how you how you view it. If you just sort of like read the incarnate bits of Jesus, then yeah. If you realise that the angel of the Lord um, is this, the second person of the Godhead, i.e. Jesus, um, the second Yahweh, as it were, throughout the Old Testament, you'll see, see him popping up all over the place. Um, and also he pops up um, to Paul on the road to Damascus um, and also to John of Patmos when he's doing his final book called Revelation. So even um, post-death, as it were, although he came back and was like, no, don't mm -hmm. worry, although I'm, my physical body's gone, I'm still around everybody. He, kept, he keeps coming back. He comes back. Does he come back? Have we got any modern-day um, examples of where Jesus has stepped in um, that we know of i mean i know we spoke to him uh, just two weeks ago but you know <laughs> that was through somebody <laughs> well <laughs> it, i mean first off I, I i i would take issue as it were when you say he died and he sort of like left his body as it were um he did come back physically um at the resurrection okay i mean if you look at the book of luke and um, chapter 24 chapter 24 is written as a ghost story um, but it's a ghost sort of story par excellence. It basically takes all of the different categories of ghost and combines them um, in an analysis of actually this this is this is Jesus. And Luke, the writer, sets up, hey, this could be Jesus. What Jesus is, hey, he could be a revenant. But hold on, revenants don't do this. He could be a spirit. 
but a spirit doesn't have a body, so he couldn't do this. And Luke is setting up these different arguments of, well, he could be this, he could be this, he could be this, and blows them away one at a time by saying, no, this is somebody who has been resurrected in a new body that somehow is trans-dimensional, that can go through walls, um, where he is more solid than solid, as C.S. Lewis put. Um, in terms of his later appearances, I mean, I only know one myself of a lady who was praying in the church that I used to go to, and we had a cross. We didn't have a crucifix. We had a cross up on the wall, and she believed that she saw Jesus come down from that cross and kiss her on the forehead, uh, um, and then went away. Now, that powerfully impacted her. So, you know, <laughs> we've also got a things where uh, missionaries have gone to tribes and the tribes will say oh yeah we, this jesus guy yeah um he talked to us out of the fire um yeah he said exactly what you're saying so that kind of fits in with my whole theos uh, theological view of something called the missio dei which is the mission of god people have this idea that the church does mission um and god joins in with it and you know hey we're going to do this mission to this place and we're going to ask god to join us I'm thinking, no, actually, God's already there. Because if you've got an omnipresent God, there can be nowhere that God isn't. And if God is pro-human, as he definitely is, then God will be speaking to people in their language, in their culture, in their way, that they can understand exactly who he is. So that when people come along afterwards and say, hey, have you heard about this guy called Jesus? They go, yeah, of course we have. I would call it the fingerprints of the divine are spread throughout time and space. Other than the Bible, is there any other physical evidence that Jesus existed? Because, I mean, I know at one point they thought the Turin Shroud was obviously the image of Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, yeah. Because Jesus dressed up like a a medieval soldier, didn't he? Yeah, or even like the, um, the... the cave that he was supposed to be buried, like um, like his tomb. The tomb, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, has, has that been discovered? And that they um, it's of Jesus, or... <laughs> well, you're not going to find any relics of Jesus, let's put it like that. Because if you raise them to death... Or <laughs> <laughs> you're not, you're not going to find any relics like that, no. But that's actually interesting in itself, because every other religious leader you can find relics of. Mm-hmm. But you can't find ones of Jesus. Hmm, strange, yeah. eh? <laughs> but well, anyway, um, I, I mean, as I say, with well, I mean, you've got how many bits of the cross have you got that could make hundreds of crosses? To be fair, when we, <laughs> we were looking what at I'm saying. when we did the show on the holy relics, we we, we made that exactly that point. Um, yeah. We said if you actually got all the bits of the cross together, you could probably make a whole ship. You know, not just a cross. You could you could probably make <laughs> yeah. an entire um, you know galleon ship out of it, and you know even down to. Um, we came across, and, and Paul's going to totally cringe when I bring this one up. Um, we were talking about, um, we found an account of the Holy Circumcision. Okay. I know, I know, right? Very weird, right. Th- really weird stories surrounding that one. But that went missing. It was kept in a box beneath a, a father's bed. Um, he didn't know what to do with it, and it got it went missing. So they, the, th- the conspiracy is the Vatican actually went and stole it. But in the scriptures, it says that when Jesus rose, he rose whole, which well, means really that it, that bit <laughs> would have gone back to Jesus. So it's I like... have never thought this one through. <laughs> I really hope that they did just drop it into a bag of hula hoops or something. <laughs> uh, or onion rings or something. No, um, definitely, definitely uh, one to chew over. Uh, with a pint when we can get back in the pub. Oh, most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, one particular lady was supposed to have had it appear on her tongue about a hundred times before she realised what it was. So, it, it, again... OK, was... my, my question would be, why? I know, that's what we said what? at the time. What was he thinking, if that was the case? Well... <laughs> that's just, that's just, I mean, I do weird. I do weird. <laughs> that's what I do. What I do. <laughs> but there's weird and there's just... Bonkers. I haven't even just, just well, no, it's beyond bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, to be honest, that's a very good point about being raised whole, um, because Jesus came down embodied as a Jew and went through all the Jewish pr- r- ritual processes. 
but raised, Jesus is for everyone. And so therefore, I would say, well, yeah, you've probably got a point there, that he would have that intact. I did say, also ask the question at the time when we was looking at that, was like, who checked? (laughs) Well, it might be doubting Thomas, who knows? Who knows, eh? But that was a a little one we came across when we was looking at, anyway, let's go back to the relics and the whole point of that was relics. We went off on a bit of a tangent. (laughs) Yeah, all right. Um, So so in terms of evidence then, yeah. So, uh, so, uh, sorry, Paul. I I think you've been insulted to say it was a little one. (laughs) <laughs> well, Matt said it was the size of an onion ring, so that's like the opposite in terms of spectrum. I didn't say that. I just no, I'm not even go down that road. No. Anyway, anyway, go back to the serious point in question here <laughs> of what Paul yeah. asked. Um, so, so, so things as I said, um, we've got writings of Josephus. We're finding writings. Um, there's written documents, the Qumran uh, documents, thousands and thousands of uh, bits of writing that include. Um, evidence of Jesus being part of um, contained within those writings Mm. Um, so you've you've got written accounts of him uh, not just the New Testament accounts but you've got the Qumran documents which contain New Testament writings as well um, or sorry contain Second Temple writings Um, and then really you kind of I mean you start to straight into things like Dan Brown territory and uh, yeah right I don't even want to go there because that's just that is weird as well that is pure conspiracy um he's brought yeah. a lot of points together to make a, a lovely fictional story which a lot of people bought into um but raises a lot of interesting concepts if you you know take various threads from those books you can go down so many rabbit holes and find out um, that they're not actually interconnected in the way that he's connected them and that certain things are mythological that he's included in there. So that is a whole different ballgame and and leads us down Mm -hmm. into the world of conspiracy um, theory, which is not what we're focused on today Uh, at all. Um, Let's talk angels. um, Let's go into that. Within the Bible, there are, there are the, the angels and, hashtag demons I hate to use that word I really don't like to use that word but it's okay <laughs> the problem... I, could, I could do both I know you can but in our world of like paranormal investigation world um that word has really been used in incredibly out of context context hasn't it uh yes it's been abused I would say um you've got to realize that the word angel um, was invented by the Septuagint's translators. That's the translators of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, which was done around about sort of like 300 BC ish. Um, they had the original term within the Greek culture was called a diamond. Mm-hmm. And a diamond was an intermediate being between God at the top level and human beings at the bottom level. And diamonds were messengers um, that, uh, well, they were ranged from anywhere from gods through to sort of DHL, Amazon delivery driver type level activity, (laughs) bringing messages between the gods um, and human beings. The problem was that uh, because when they were writing these Jewish the, the Greek translation for a Jewish audience at the time, um, you, they wanted to get a, away from the idea of Diamon being just uh, such a mixed bag of, of particular characters. And so they wanted to say, well, we're going to make a, not a category, and not an ontological category of beings, but we're going to make a, a description, a job description of a being that carries a message from the eternal one to human beings. And that from the eternal one to the human beings, we're going to call an angel, an angelos. Um, We're going to distinguish that from a diamond, which could be a human spirit, or it could be uh, a god um, with a small g, as in not one of the god, uh, not the eternal god, but one of the created gods. Or it could be uh, an intermediate being, um, that is not one of the gods or not a human spirit. And so that kind of came about in order to clarify 
when they say a diamond, when the reader read diamond, it was to clarify to them, actually, no, we're going to put the word angel in here so that you know that this is a spirit being from God to us. Um, so that's kind of what they did. So they, they created this classification, as it were, um, of, of being, which is kind of like how when we read of uh, the diamonds within the Bible, um, they've got all sorts of different names within the Old Testament, and then you get into diamonds in the New Testament. Um, and then you also got into the, the angels, which kind of, I mean, we think of angels today as being these white beings with great big wings, and uh, you don't mess with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of them, I would say that is pretty much the case. But I kind of say, well, what do you mean by angel? Because angel just means messenger. There are different spirit beings that are still within the the, the divine counsel of God, shall we say, um, from watchers through to Ophanim, which are the uh, throne bearers. They're the ones with the wheels, within the wheels and the eyes all around them. Pretty scary characters from Ezekiel. Uh, and then you get to um, the seraphim and the cherubim. Now, the this is, this is another thing about the context and how the context makes the difference. The seraphim is a serpentine creature uh, that is fiery, and it's a throne guardian. And these images, the serpentine throne guardians, come from the times of the Hebrews when they were in Egypt. Because if you look in Egyptian culture, snakes appear quite a bit as throne guardians. Uh, and the seraph is, uh, it means a the, the 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 character who appears in the Garden of Eden, we we hear of the talking snake, as it were. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually the Nakash, which is a bright, shining, serpentine one. Um, that is imagery that comes from that Egyptian time when Genesis was being sort of compiled, and and just afterwards. Then you get to times of things like Isaiah, and. Um, Ezekiel and that, where they are in Babylonian captivity, Babylonian Assyrian culture type stuff. Um, and the throne guardians that appear in those books are ones that have uh, four faces an ox, a lion, an eagle, and a human. So they're chimeral characters. And those appear as the same sort of characters that are in the big, uh, the big guardian. Uh, statues that we see on temples in the in the Mesopotamian region. Were they the same beings? I actually say yes. Seraphim and cherubim are the same beings. But then, as you go through time to sort of medieval times, you get this idea of cherubim being these fat babies with <laughs> wings. Uh, yeah, you do. It's like, like, where the heck did that come from? I'm sorry, but no, they, they were big, beasty things that you just didn't mess with. Um, but you know, when when angels appear in the Bible, they are pretty much always start with "Do not fear." Mm. Um, that's because you know, when one appeared to people, it was often sort of like, "Well, let's open a small sewage farm in my trousers." <laughs> they were scary characters. Um, you just didn't you just didn't mess with them. So therefore, how we've developed we've we've domesticated angels uh, to the point now where you know we say, "Oh, I've got a guardian angel." Mm. Uh, and I know that because I can see a feather occasionally. And it's like, well, no, these, these, this stuff, it doesn't come from Judeo-Christian sort of understanding of it. Although some some beings have wings, uh, they're not angels, they, because necessarily, because as I say, angel is just a, a job function. It's not an ontological classific- uh, category of being. Um and then you get to today where we've got uh, demons like uh, Zach, what's he say, Zach Bagans in uh, his ghost adventures and that where everything's a demon. Mm-hmm. And it seems to be now that any negative being that we come across is a demon. Yeah. Um, and my, my whole thesis is kind of like, well, we need to rewind the clock back to well, what were diamonds actually? because then we can understand that diamonds included human spirits. And so therefore, you can then say, well, okay, what are we experiencing now in the paranormal? 
are we experiencing just purely non-human evil, evil spirits? Or are we experiencing humans who have been pretty nasty throughout their life and haven't changed since they've gone into the afterlife? Um, I don't believe that you instantly change when you, when you hit that terminus of being in the flesh. I think there's still a, a process that goes on um, towards becoming more fully what we were meant to be. Well, there you go, guys. That's just us putting people in boxes again or, or entities in boxes, basically, isn't it? We, had to, we have to classify things and put them in boxes. And, um, We've you're... always done it, though. We've yeah. always done it throughout history. So it's, it's, it's a human thing to categorise stuff so that we can understand it better. Yeah, and, and that, that's just pure human nature, isn't it? You know, we have to have it in a box. If it doesn't fit in a box, we sort of go into a mini meltdown until we can classify it. Even make think. up new boxes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, and I'm saying let's 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 put let's try and see what was in the original wrapping. <laughs> so, how much of that do you think comes down to archetypal types, where which is a concept that Carl Jung um, explored within ourselves? We all have characters deep within our own psyche that um, come forward as characterizations. Um, what do you think that? this is part of that or do you think this is a separate thing <laughs> it's a difficult <laughs> one i think i think the way as i said with the the seraphim the cherubim i think the way that beings present themselves to us they present themselves in ways that we can understand and that we would say yep yeah, that was definitely an angel or that was definitely such and such I mean, when I—I I mean, I have a story of an angel that appeared to us when we were we got off the plane at Cyprus. We'd got a taxi, uh, not a taxi, we bought, got a hire car, driven down the motorway. We're trying to find a particular village, and we got lost. I read a road sign wrong because um, the letter P in Greek, or sorry, the letter R in Greek, is a capital P. Oh. So I read a road sign wrong. We got completely lost. This is two o'clock in the morning pitch black, back roads, no idea what's going on. And my mum, my brother and I were in the car and we just said, OK, God, we haven't got a clue where we're going. Please help us. And as soon as we said amen, headlights came over the brow of the hill. The car pulled up alongside us. Why a car would pull up alongside us, I don't know. Maybe it's just there's a car there with some people in. But in plain English, spoke without us saying anything. How can I help you? Now, <laughs> timing-wise was interesting mm -hmm. uh maybe the registration of the car was such that they knew that it was a higher car i don't know that could be an, ex an explanation and their guess would be well it's a higher car so they're probably going to be english or at least speaking a bit of english they knew exactly where we were going pointed us in the direction and disappeared and we all said okay that was an angel mm. okay and we would say well, yeah, it does fit that category of messenger, um, that it's brought a message to say this is the safe way to go. Um, it didn't appear as a great big ball of light or anything with wings or anything like that. So did it fit into our archetypes of what an angel would be? I don't think it did, but it fitted into our understanding of what it would be when we were able to re reflect upon the experience. Mm -hmm. No, oh, I'm with you on that. I think you, they, they appear as you expect them to appear sometimes and in the most unexpected ways. We hear that in stories of the Fae as well. When we looked into yeah. the Fae mythology, they don't appear as you like little tinkerbells. Um, again, we've, we've domesticated the Fae, haven't we? But in that respect... Oh, Tolkien, Tolkien flipped his lid when he was talking about, you know, with the fairies, Fae, are not the diminutive little folk of the Victorian times. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and Tolkien was a Christian as well. He wrote a lot of his stuff based on a Christian theology. And the more you look into things like um, the way that his, his world, his supernatural world works, mm. the more we start to say, actually, this kind of really does fit a biblical model of a spiritual middle ground, as it were. C.S. Lewis was a bit like that as well. Yeah, yeah well, C.S. Lewis was openly writing allegory of the Christian experience. Um, Tolkien wasn't writing allegory um, as such. Um, but he, he, he wrote more than, more than allegory. But they both of them, I mean, Tolkien got really annoyed at Lewis because Lewis sort of like was listening to all this stuff in the pub and 
he went and wrote it down in seven books, which was much quicker than <laughs> Tolkien to write his legendarium. <laughs> Just a little side note, what did you think of the films? Did you think it did it justice? Uh, yeah, I, I actually really enjoyed them. Um, we, we were living in Abingdon at the time and we went up to the Eagle and Child and had a pint in there every time before we went and saw The Lord of the Rings. Mm. Um, it was just tradition by the time we did it the <laughs> third time, as everything normally does. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed those films and I think there was so much that um, Walsh and Jackson brought to it um, as well that uh, sorry I've just seen an orb flying through there <laughs> um, no, it's just dust don't worry um, we know <laughs> um, but yeah look, um, Walsh and Jackson brought a lot to it as well so I, I, I personally think that you know behind the scenes Tolkien might have been sort of having a few whispers in people's ears or inspiring people to do stuff no, um, so you know I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with that no problem at all I thought it was an inspired um, inspired um, rendition of the books I think he, it was just brilliant I thought he translated that into film perfectly I don't think yeah. anybody could ever do better on that um, there's a series coming up apparently they're doing a series yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, well if it's as good as the Mandalorian, <laughs> then yeah. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> but we'll but I mean things things like um, I mean restitution and laying of the laying of the unquiet dead, as it were. You've you've got the dead men have done Harrow, mm -hmm. and when Aragorn goes and um, sort of like communicates with them and says, okay, you've got an opportunity now to to find your peace. Um, you know that kind of to me speaks quite a lot of well i am to bring peace in this world um but i'm also to bring peace in the afterlife as it were to those that have passed over mm -hmm. um whether it is by just doing the old well technical term psychopomping um just moving them on as it were presenting them as it were to god or to the angels that take them up um or or those that have are restless, being able to bring peace to them as well through often often through just something simple as just celebrating communion, which is a very reconciliate. It provides a reconciliatory act between humans and God. Mm. See, even in modern day media, we can find religious and Christian and themes that run through can't we it's well, god's fingerprints are everywhere yeah we're being subjected to it even when you don't realize that you are in something as is as, as fictional as lord of the rings we or c.s lewis or any of those those themes are running through so you're though in your deep psyche these messages of of you know these stories and these messages are going in they're, they are you are being subjected to it even if you don't realize you are and and as yeah. matt says you know god's fingerprints are everywhere let's talk um then about the division in those um, categories that we talked uh, about in regard to angels what happened there why did why was there arguments between them which is why they, some of them got cast out oh sorry okay sorry i thought you were talking about the uh why did human beings argue about the categories? Oh, no, um, no, no. I'm up, <laughs> I'm up in the ethers again now. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so so some, the, the original rebel, um, who we now call Satan, mm -hmm. um, that was a, a, an anointed cherub, so an anointed throne guardian um, that walked amongst the, the, the stones of fire, which we believe is... In the, is a metaphor for other spiritual beings um, on the top of the holy mountain. The whole Bible is kind of like two mountains, really. It's Mount Zion and Mount Hermon. Mount Zion is Yahweh's mountain. Mount Hermon is where the, the angels that fell, the heavenly beings that fell, um, descended upon the earth. So in the beginning, you've got pride. Pride enters the, the heart of the original rebel who wants to be like his creator he wants to take take reign over his creator why that happened i don't know the origins of pride um 
the origin of sin, I don't think we know where that comes from. Um, but that is a product of, uh, well, it's not a product, it's a, it's a, a risk of giving creatures free will. You can choose to love me or you can choose not to love me. Um, God didn't make robots just, you know, I can program a computer to say 10. Uh, 10 print, I love you. 20 go to 10. And it'll just go right up the screen, I love you. What does that mean? It means nothing. I've just programmed the computer to do it. Um, for a being to actually reciprocate love of their own volition is the ultimate love that, that is shown. So therefore, to create beings that have that ability to love back means also that they have the ability n not to. And so therefore, the original rebel chose not to. Uh, then we've got the, the Edenic scene with uh, human beings and the story of um, the temptation and the fall, the first fall of human beings. Or, well, the first fall. Often in Western Christianity, we just stick with that as being what we call the fall. And the world's calamities are all because of that. However, if you read the Bible, then uh, you'll find that there's a couple more falls. And if you go and ask an ancient Jew, what's the fall? They would actually say, well, there are three falls. There's the first fall, which is the Edenic one of humans. Um, and then you've also got a fall within Genesis 6, where you've got the sons of God marrying the daughters of men. Now, you get to times of things like Augustine, um, who said, well, actually, this is a bit embarrassing. We can't explain how you can have sexual acts between angels and uh, heavenly beings and women. Um, and we can't explain how semen would be sort of like be able to transmit and that sort of stuff, all of the mechanics of it. All I would say to that is, well, hold on a second. You've got Jesus. Uh, go figure, guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're happy you're happy to accept that jesus was born of a virgin but you're not happy to go with this sons of god um actually being what they are throughout the rest of scripture are heavenly beings so you get that sort of like uh, you get this this wish i think it is to be embodied we want offspring of our own um we've got this seed of god which is through Adam and Eve and the rest of humankind. We actually want some of our own seed. We want to be creators of beings ourselves rather than just leave that up to the eternal creator. And so therefore, you've got this descent of the watchers that were originally there to teach human beings about things like agriculture, about medicine, and all that sort of stuff. So they were originally good guys that turned bad and they corrupted their ways by using all of the the good things and p completely twisting them in the opposite direction so things like metallurgy metal smithing mm. right all of that can be used for good stuff like agriculture building plows mm. but they actually used it to produce swords so they're they came down, taught us good things, but then perverted their ways to teach us bad things, uh, to use that stuff. Uh, which is interesting how throughout, sort of when you get to the end time prophecies, um, you talk, it talks about turning swords into plowshares. Um, so it's the reversing of that corruption that happened with humankind back in the second fall. And the you get this descent of the watchers that produce this ungodly offspring this these what what the what enoch one enoch calls the bastard sons of god which is a great title of a paper if you look it up um <laughs> and, and and basically they were called the uh, i think uh, mesmer or metzmer um the bastards basically and these were illegitimate children that were effectively what the Greeks called the Titans. Um, and so therefore, you've got this these giants. They called them giants in the Greek. Um, but I'm six foot six, and I'm pretty much a giant compared to some of my friends who are only five foot one, five foot two. 
So when you read about giants in the Bible, you have to kind of say, well, they were just pretty tall people, mm. I would have thought. Um, so you've got these people that are illegitimate, and they become the, the story of one Enoch um, tells us that they became uh, destructive to not just human life, but they became destructive to animal, plants, and the landscape. So these giants, in inverted commas, became destructive to life, full stop, mm. to the planet and everything. And that's why you get the, the Noahic flood um, taking place, and that's why you get some of the animals going on there, because they didn't just corrupt human beings, they corrupted the animal life uh, as well. And then you get to the Tower of Babel, which is the third fall, where um, God says, okay, I'm going to divide the nations up, and I'm going to put one of my sons, uh, one of my children, in charge of each of these nations. And um, But Israel is going to be my lot, okay? So you're going to have uh, a, child, a son of God over you. You're going to have a son of God over you. But Israelites, you're going to be my portion. Um, and then these guys decided that they also would accept worship as well. So that's what you get with the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, we've got these sort of paintings of very high tall buildings or you know with and it says you know with its it reaches to the heavens but actually you can translate the original hebrew as with it with the heavens with the heavenlies or the heavens in its top and if you look at the ziggurats of that area area they have temples at the top of them the ones that are remaining um and so therefore you can say well these guys that were assigned nations to look after, to point towards the creator, to because God runs a bureaucracy of, you know, he doesn't do everything. God allocates jobs to various beings mm -hmm. and people. And these guys just rebelled, uh, accepted worship on their own. And as a result, uh, they were judged. Um, so that's why you've got these different fallings of angels. The, the spirits, the evil spirits um, that we have in the Bible generally come from the bastard sons of God that were destroyed in the flood um, because the watchers that were judged are imprisoned uh, in Tartarus until the end. So therefore, they're, they're kind of out of the equation, pretty much. They're not able to influence us. But you have still got evil spirits that are not human that can influence us. And you can also have human spirits who have been evil in this life and continue to be evil in the la in the next. On that note, we've actually come to the... You're going to have to wait on that one, Paul, I'm afraid. Because yeah. <laughs> we've come to the end of the first half of the show. Listen to this, but please join us after the break because this is a fascinating discussion. We'll be right back after this. Hello, Harry Price here. If there's nothing me and my friends enjoy more here on the other side, it is to sit back and relax and listen to the Paranormal Concept Show right here on the PAUK Radio Network. Broadcasting a plethora of interesting and informative content for all your paranormal needs. Find them across social media to keep up to date with forthcoming shows and all their other adventures. Hello, is there anybody there? And welcome back to the Paranormal Concept Show, exclusive to the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Now, before the break, we were delving into the fall and the Satan and the, the millions that fell and all that sort of thing. And Paul had a question um, and we had to break for the break. So, Paul, fire away, darling. OK, um, basically, you, I, I was reading one of your blogs on your website and it was talking about the Nephilim and that they were the Watchers. So I'm assuming that's who you was referring to about when you called them the Watchers. Yes, I mean, there's lots and lots of arguments backwards and forwards about who the Nephilim were. Um, for 2,000 years plus, they've been arguing what they are. Uh, Nephal um, is the original Hebrew, which, comes, which gives us the Nephilim. Um, and it means fallen. So there's a clue in itself as to what that means. Uh, it's to do with the fallen ones. Um, some people have said that it's the, the hybrid offspring of the Watchers. Um, but it doesn't really seem to fit with the text um, because the text talks about the Nephilim and it also talks about the Gibberim, the Gibberim um, which are different beings. And so therefore, when you look at the Gibberim, you look at, and the Septuagint writers, they translate those as the giant, as the Gigantes. 
um, the Titan type characters that were the offspring of um, that were the sons of God basically so I would say that the Nephilim were the sons of God that fell uh, and the Gibberim were the ones that uh, were the hybrid offspring the bastard sons of God okay so there you go now I'm going to change tracks a little on this (laughs) <laughs> of all the things I could bring up at this point, I am actually going to change track because I'm sure there's a question that most of our listeners are now probably thinking is for somebody so well versed. I mean, you're, you're coming out with like references to, to parts in the Bible and stuff like that just off the top of your head. How did you get into the paranormal? I mean, I know you picked <laughs> the book that is like the best paranormal book ever. If you haven't read the Bible, then I suggest you do. Um, it starts with paranormal phenomenon right from the word go. So how did you get into the paranormal? Uh, <laughs> at primary school, I was, everybody in the class had a little project that we had to learn how to do research. And I, I went into the school library, a little thing, 15 by 15 foot, and had a little poem through and saw this Usborne world of the strange ghosts and I thought ooh <laughs> that looks interesting and it was full of really pictures um, of, of ghost stories and and how to do a paranormal investigation um, and we've got to remember this is the 70s mm. and uh, so you hadn't got your um, EVP, you hadn't got your SLS cameras, you hadn't got your spirit boxes or any of that. You just got a tape recorder and a notebook and a thermometer <laughs> and that was pretty much it. Um, and I, I read this and, and I was fascinated by it. I mean, the, the one that's been the picture that comes to mind is that double page spread of the haunted house with the little pictures that say this is what happens here and the clock strikes 13 somebody's going to die and 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 that was amazing and so I, I got into it slightly that way um a strange story to do with that and um i went to another class later on and we were given a, a same idea of go and produce a a, a project and I'm kind of a bit lazy in the sense that I, will, <laughs> I recycled what I wanted to do. Um, and also because I was still interested. So I went to try and get that book, but it, uh, it had been ripped up. Um, it, there were two books that had been ripped up overnight in that school library and torn to sort of like inch square shreds. And there was a, an announcement. I, I, we saw it in the as we went back through to school, uh, through to our classes. And there was an announcement in the um, assembly, you know, if anybody knows any information. Nobody found out who it was. About probably 35, 36 years later, get to Facebook and meet people who went to the same school, primary school as me. And I said, did I actually just invent this or did, did this really happen? And two or three people went, yeah, this definitely did happen. We remember that. And I'm like, oh, how weird. <laughs> um, so, so I kind of had been interested in ghosts then. I mean, I got through Scooby Doo as well. I'm one of the the the, um, the haunted generation, as we call it, mm-hmm. uh, from the 70s, and and so I grew up with all of that weird shizzle, um, and it's never really gone from me. Uh, I became a Christian when I was 14. Um, I've been to church since a little kid, and I'm a thinker. I ask those questions that nobody wants to ask or nobody really wants to try and answer properly and when people were trying to fob me off with questions about the paranormal and they're going oh it's just demons I'm like well hold on what about this C.S. Lewis guy who's turned up Uh, he's appeared to J.B. Phillips as I said previously and do you think you could be having demons creating a translation of the Bible? I mean, <laughs> but that's going to create people who are going to be followers of Jesus. It's kind of a massive own goal, isn't it? And so all these logical inconsistencies then started to say, well, maybe there's something to it that is real. My first, I would say, proper encounter um, that kind of set me well on this track was uh, in 2011 when we went to what's called the home group where our church kind of had separate uh, meetings outside of a Sunday and you got together with your friends and you did some Bible study. 
and I decided I was going to bring a DVD. We were going to watch a film and we were going to talk about it. I got my little um, media box. I'd brought that with me because I'm prepared just in case I haven't got the equipment. Mm-hmm. I wasn't prepared enough. I'd forgotten to bring the lead that goes between the box and the telly. So I went, you know, okay, can we, you know, have you got anything that can do this? And the, the, there were three generations of female living in that house, one of each generation. And the, the mum, the eldest, the grandmother, I'll call her, said, oh, yeah, there's one up in uh, this, this girl's room, the, the youngest's room, uh, top, of the, top of the house. Um, just go in, get it. She's not in, so don't worry. So off I potted. As I literally got through the door, the, the door jam, through the, through the door frame, it, it was kind of like a really heavy presence. It was almost like walking into jelly, invisible jelly. And it was like, what the heck is this? And there was this feeling, this internal voice that said, get out. You're not welcome here. That was the feeling that I got. You're not welcome. Just get out. I was like, well, this is just stupid. I'm only going for a DVD lead. <laughs> <laughs> so I could see across, the, uh, across the, the bedroom. Oh, there it is. Right. So I'm kind of trying to just get through to this DVD. I remember picking the box up and just going flick, flick like that, mm. try and look around the back and couldn't see the lead. So I turned around and went, ah, oh, I can't see the door because it was hidden away in a corner. So that's when I panicked and I, I just kind of like ran and I, got the, down the stairs and the mum said the middle mum uh, the, the mother of the daughter said do you feel anything in that room i'm like no no <laughs> no no i'm thinking what the heck <laughs> so anyway i went and spoke to the um to the minister um who would have been there at the time i spoke to him afterwards and he said oh yeah well the, the thing is they've had um the the youngest daughter had been playing with ouija in that room and mm-hmm. As a result, I've done a bit of a blessing on the place, but it, it's obvious that she's still using the stuff mm. um, by the sound of what you've said. I've since sort of, looking back on it, if I'd have known what had happened in that room beforehand, I would have just said, oh, yeah, well, I was psychologically primed. I was expecting to find something in there. But I'd literally just gone up for a DVD lead. Um, so the fact that I felt that, inner voice of get out you're not welcome Mm. i'm like okay uh there's something to this and the fact that it was corroborated by the mum who actually afterwards said yeah we've seen shadow people on these stairs um and i'm thinking okay that's the second time at that point in two months that i'd heard the term shadow people i'd never heard it before i'm thinking okay something's going on here since then i've been involved in ministry uh in a village um where I, near where I live now and we've kind of had the occasional call to go and help people who have experienced strangeness in their house um, and my own friendship base has a lot of neo-pagans and one of the neo-pagan ladies said to me you know look I'm, I'm having problems something's happening can you come and help sort it out because I haven't got the power to do this and I'm like well I don't have the power to do this but I know somebody who does. <laughs> his, name's, his name's Jesus, and uh, you know. But I'm I'm not a Bible basher <laughs> like that. But you know what I mean. Um, so we just went round, prayed around the house, um, felt some cold spots, um, and I messaged her the next day, and she said, "Oh, um, how how are you doing?" And she said, "I've slept for the first time in months, like a baby." Oh. And her husband and her family, sort of like they've only had one incident since then. Um, and I've had other experiences like that. Um, the, the worst was um, when we were going through some family stress uh, with my eldest, and we ended up with uh, a, an exercise book. He was sat downstairs in the lounge with us watching the telly. Our two youngest were upstairs on their computers playing Minecraft. Um, and the smoke alarm went off. I'm thinking, okay. Well, I've just bought a new soldering station. Um, I must have left that switched on. I went into the kitchen. It was stone cold. My eldest went into the dining room, and there was a big fire on the table. Um, His exercise book had self-combusted. 
that and the slow cooker that didn't like to cook chicken, the actual switches, the physical plug switch would switch off when we put a chicken in the slow cooker um, <laughs> and left it. And we we were all out of the house. There was nobody able to get back in because they were all, you know, bus journeys away from the house, the kids. Uh, nobody else had a um, key to the house. And just weird things like that. You just think, well, OK. But when, when I first went into ministry, somebody said, um, you might get the occasional person who's really desperately in need of some money for some food knocking on the door. Um, and there was a, like a, a little fund that could help people out like that. You know, I could go and take them to Tesco's and do some shopping for them mm. and uh, just claim the receipt. Um, so within a few days, the doorbell would be ringing in the middle of the night um, and then in the daytime. And, you know, I'm the scientist who says, well, maybe there's some water dripping into it. Um, but then the doorbell's in a port watch so the water can't get to it so you know i'm like okay fine these are weird things that happen if somebody needs some help i'm happy to just sort of like say well okay if you want some peace i'll do a communion help you out sort of thing mm. um you might not be in the flesh but hey i'm not gonna nitpick on that one <laughs> <laughs> it is a um a melding. I mean, let's talk about your electronic background. Um, we're not just talking to somebody who knows the scriptures. He's also incredibly scientific-minded. You work in electronics, right? No, I'm, a, I'm actually a supply teacher for physics. Um, so my background, my degree is chemical and mineral engineering. But I've had electronics as a hobby since I was nine. So I'd be building things like bat detectors by the time I was 14. I've always been interested in picking up stuff that is not available to the ordinary senses. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of interested in that. And I see some of the stuff like the spirit boxes, which are, for all intents and purposes, just a radio that can't, um, it's had its station lock circuitry disconnected. Um, and then I look at things like pareidolia and how, how the human brain interprets patterns because we are, beings that are made for rational thought and part of our evolution as it were is to to spot danger and so we're very 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 good at pattern spotting mm -hmm. as a result of that um you know we will spot patterns where there are <laughs> where there's not necessarily anything there for instance in clouds mm -hmm. um so so when I look at things like the electronics that are used in today's sort of paranormal stuff, I just think to myself, yeah, I would expect some disturbance of electromagnetics um, to, to be present, um, especially if you're trying to manifest mass out of nothing. There's going to be some sort of energy change that's taking place there in poltergeist phenomena. But... As to what's going on under the bonnet, I would say we don't know at this stage. We just seem to be able to use the scientific tools that we've got to say this is possibly energy grounding from a stressful situation or, um, you know, things like astral travel and lucid dreaming and all that sort of stuff. You know, is this stuff that is happening where our spirit leaves the body and we can communicate in that way with each other um, and we see things that we don't normally see when we're in the rational self in the in the conscious state which says don't be stupid you just didn't see that um, but when it comes to the electronic side of things um, I'm a little bit cautious as to how much emphasis is placed on using electronics to find evidence of the paranormal i think there's too much subjectivity that goes on and there's also too much commercialism that's gone on as well people want to sell stuff mm -hmm. and people and people are being given pseudoscientific explanations as to how it works and because people aren't necessarily scientifically trained they will look at that and go wow this torch It'll switch on when I ask it a question. It'll turn off again. It'll turn on when I ask it another question. But that's just um, but a metallic expansion 
uh, due to heat and that sort of stuff. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of more the, the ASAP side of things in, in that sense of uh, testing everything. And, and actually, that's a biblical thing in itself. Test everything. Hold on to what is true. Um, so, you know, test it. I'm, I'm, I am a skeptic in, in some of the claims, but I wouldn't say necessarily that, you know, that everything is, is just human, as it were. Mm -hmm. There is another side to you that I wish to explore a little bit. Oh, no. (laughs) Not only do you have these other strings to your bow that we're talking about tonight, but you're also a a mentalist, a stage mentalist. Oh, dear me, you must be a mind reader. How would you find that out? (laughs) (laughs) Have a good look around your website, darling. (laughs) Oh, dear. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have done stage mentalism. I used to be a member of Secrets, which is the um, British Society of Mystery Entertainers, and uh, Nottingham Guild of Magicians as well. I, I had to kind of give it up when I went into ministry in 2015, 2014, simply because there was just too much going on at the time. But now I'm out of it. I want to kind of recapture that stuff. Because that brings in so many interesting psychological aspects, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, for me, my journey into mentalism was because I was kind of this Darren Brown character. Is he really in cahoots with the devil, <laughs> as some, of, some of these fundies say, or is there another way of doing it? So, again, study to show myself approved of God. I just went and studied um, mentalist techniques using various books that you can find available in the public domain. But uh, I'm just going to say Google is your friend on that one. Um, <laughs> and... And uh, then I realized I, I got a book by, by about Chung Ling Su, who is the guy, I think he's the first guy to die from the bullet catch. Um, but he was um, he Eng- English guy dressed up as a Chinese guy um, because it was all mystical at the time. Mm-hmm. But he also did a lot of investigations of um, mediumship, physical mediumship. And as a result of that, he was able to produce pretty much all of the uh, the stuff that they could do. And I think the SPR had a lot of that sort of types of character that were going in to explore what was going on in the physical mediumship realm, Um, which is why I think physical mediumship is, especially now that we've got infrared cameras and photography, that's kind of died its death almost. Although I did see that they got an episode on it on, um, oh, what's that, Netflix Surviving Death. Yeah, it's very generic. Um, I found that series. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, mentalism really is quite handy for spotting things like cold reading. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you can. I've, I've sat there alongside um, numerology, reading people and all that sort of stuff, and you're listening and you're just going, "Yep, that's a fork." They forked, said one thing, and then backed up and gone down there to, to find a hit. Um, so. I wouldn't say I'm as closed-minded as Darren Brown is, Mm. Um, but I do see a lot of it. I've seen it in the church. I was at a a church in um, a big Pentecostal-type church in the town that I used to live in and went there for nine months, and one of the meetings they had was how to prophesy. I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. Let's have a look at that. So Saturday morning, I'm there, and the guy's there, and he's standing at the front facing us and he's going, now I'm going to give you an example of how you can do this. Uh, there's somebody here who's got a pain in their left side. Silence. And I'm thinking, hey up. <laughs> and, he then, and then he said, oh, it must be because I'm looking at you. So therefore, you're reversed. So it will be on your right side. Bingo, two hands go up. And then he went off on one. And I'm thinking, you know what? You're just as bad as the people you say are using cold reading techniques uh, in, say, a tarot reading or stuff like that. You, <gasps> you're just as bad. Says, so he's talking to a tarot reader. <gasps> she says. I, I, I've got, <laughs> I, uh, my little dirty secret is I've got five sets of tarot cards. There we go. I'm going public. I'm out of the broom closet. <laughs> Excellent. I do love people to coming out on the but, show. <laughs> okay. But but I I mean I I bought them. I bought a pack once uh, at a mind body spirit fair and my wife picked it out and we went what on earth have you bought these for <laughs> and and then as we're driving back she's kind of picking them out and you've got the world and you've got the lovers 
and and it's like hold on a second there's a heck of a lot of christian imagery in this oh yeah and i'm i and i went well okay let's have a let's uh, i can't be the first person to have thought this let's have a look online google uh christians and tarot and up came a book beyond spirituality by a guy called john drain who'd written all about the christianity and the tarot Mm -hmm. i was like wow (laughs) okay (laughs) you know i won't use them for fortune telling because that's kind of but they are very good with the archetypal stuff yeah Yeah. i mean you know i I used to do a lot of mind body spirit fairs um as as a church parachurch team so lots of different church people that were interested in this sort of stuff from different churches would get together we wouldn't do bible bashing we'd just sort of like offer prayer and that sort of stuff and uh, I'd got this thing called the Jesus deck, um, and I used to do Jesus deck readings with people. Um, so, you know, my minister at the time said, oh, it sounds a bit dodgy, let's have a go. I pulled, he pulled the three cards out, and then he started doing the reading himself. I was like, okay. <laughs> so he then went out, he went out with me in the marketplace, and he sat down, and he said, after three hours, he'd had six readings with people, each about half an hour long, and he said, Matt, you just twisted my head with this. How how can God use a pack of cards to have a conversation with someone about God that I've never met? Mm-hmm. And it's deeper than some of the conversations I've had with my church members. Um, <laughs> you know, the, as I say, God's fingerprints are everywhere. So, you know, if you seek, you find. Very true. Very true indeed. Well, you redeemed yourself there, is all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I, 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 as I say, I've been down in the woods with um, with practicing witches um, at various sabbats um, as the church guy, as the Christian. Mm. So you know, and I've spoken at Pagan Pride UK for five five years, um, and Nottingham's Imperium Society. Oh, um, you must so know my lovely Ashley Mortimer office. then. Ash. Oh yes, I know Ash very well. Brilliant bloke. Brilliant he is. bloke. He's one of my friends. I like him a lot. Yeah. And Cal Sarah Cooper, and Cal Cooper Cal, friends. Yeah. We've got a lot yeah. of mutual friends, uh, Matt. <laughs> yeah, it's a small world. <laughs> it is really, isn't it? <laughs> so how do we um, go forward with this? When I speak to uh, my local church, they won't, They. I tried to get one of the, uh, the local um, reverends on, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he just wouldn't come on to discuss faith in the community and the importance of that. And that's the road I wanted to go down on that show. Um, and they just wouldn't discuss it. I think he was scared I would go um, <laughs> down the exorcism route and stuff like that, which, you know, I wouldn't have out of respect unless he was prepared to. Um, and, and yet we meet someone like you who's very open minded and sees relevance of paranormal phenomena occurring in the Bible, trying to make sense of that. You know, bringing it forward. Why have we got such a, a, a division within within the church? I think a lot of it is to do with how we've approached um, the paranormal throughout the last 2,000 years, really. Um, starting with Augustine, um, going onwards, you've seen, and, and through to Luther, you've seen this winnowing away of this middle ground um, between the physical plane and the sort of the top plane of God's domain. Um, missiologist called Paul Hybert uh, wrote a paper called The Floor of the Excluded Middle, where he went out into various tribal cultures uh, in the Far East and discovered that they had got not just uh, an eternal being, but they got this realm of um, everyday creatures in the spirit realm that would be used for various things and then in the the bottom realm was the realm of science as it were hard science and in the west we've we've kind of removed this middle ground and we've kind of rationalized it away the church itself is pretty guilty of rationalizing a lot of the stuff as uh, philosophers like uh, theologians like Bultmann um, in the 20th century kind of demythologized the bible so much that we still inherit this, oh, well, these miracles couldn't have really happened. Oh, this walking on water couldn't have happened. Um, this raising from the dead couldn't have happened. All this sort of stuff. And it's like, well, what have you got left? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, we, 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 part of my dissertation um, to, looked at the, the increasing interest in the paranormal over the last century, mm-hmm. uh, through to this one. And 
at times of great crisis where you've got World War One and World War Two, they've got massive loss of life where people have died in battlefields, loved ones haven't been able to say goodbye properly in the normal grieving process and, and letting go. Um, and as a result, you saw the spiritualist movement rapidly increase. Um, about 1939, there was a spiritualism report that was done um, by a small sort of group of people from uh, from the Church of England um, that was presented. And at the time, it was kind of, yeah, we've got more important things to do sort of thing. And so it was kind of put aside. Now, people have got this conspiracy theory that, oh, well, they didn't really like the findings of it, and so therefore they buried it. That's not strictly true. The things is just that the Church of England and it has its red tape and stuff gets put aside and not released for so long anyway. Um, but a guy called Michael Perry, who's one of my predecessors as editor of the um, Christian Parapsychologist Journal, he pr- managed to get hold of this report uh, and he's produced it. And you can actually see that some of that report says um, some of these claims that are done by these particular groups we need to explore further. Now, when I read it as the major report and the minority report, the major report says, yeah, we can go in this completely open-minded. Um, the minority report says, yeah, we can be open-minded, but don't have our brains drop out. There's, some of this has got some chicanery going on. Um, so, <laughs> And then you get to things like uh, the Michael Taylor incident in 19, early 1970s where that exorcism that took place that uh, went very badly wrong. They didn't finish the job off. Allegedly, they left stuff in this guy who then went and ripped the face off his wife, and uh, it all went horribly, horribly wrong. He murdered her. Um, And that caused the Church of England to go, hold on a second, we really need to sort this whole exorcism uh, situation out. And so they kind of put in some really good safeguards that have been since then um, updated and I think actually they're very good safeguards um, that make sure that if you do have this sort of thing uh, it's got to be done properly and you get uh, you get medical practitioners in as well Mm -hmm. so it's not just spiritual there's an assessment of the the psychological uh, makeup of the person and all of that so so I think rather than um, just leave it for anybody to say oh you've got a demon in you you need exercising which some of the churches still do Mm. and can cause a lot of damage to people as a result Uh, the church of england itself is quite guarded in that respect and it's very rare that an exorcism will take place Um, so i think really it's always been there it's been buried Mm. um but i think with the increase in paranormal uh in the popular culture i think it's going to miss a trick if it kind of just sits on its backside and does nothing about it hence there are things like um the church's fellowship for psychical spiritual studies which were formed just after 1939 it's coming up to its 70th 70th anniversary now um and they were created to say actually we want to seriously look at this stuff rather than and, and take a christian perspective of it but you know, have, have that Bible-based stuff, but have that science-based stuff as well so that we can look at this um, rather than brush it under the carpet like some people sadly try and do. Mm. It's, it's incredibly, like, you know, the safeguard measures, like you've just said, are incredibly important, and even more so um, in recent times, mental health of um, people seems to have declined um, through mm. before, and this was going on before um, COVID struck, um, really, there's been there has been a decline in general mental well-being. Is that do you feel down to an erosion of faith in these theologies, or do you think that's just the pressures of modern society? I think it's kind of both. Um, I think knowing who you are and who you are, your Christ-centered self-definition can help you go through these times of what I call the desert experience where there's very little to do. Uh, in the, the Christian mystics always talk about this formational desert time where things are just winnowed away and you just focus down on the basics. 
and if you don't know who you are and whose you are, then you know you can get all discombobulated as to well, what's the point of being here? Then you can also get things like, well, I'm locked up in my house all day. I'm not able to see anybody. I usually go to work. I'm starting to hear creaks and bangs and knocks in my house. Uh, I must be haunted. Mm. Um, and actually, there's just a lot of everyday thermal expansion going on in the house as the sun comes up and warms your bricks and your timbers of your house. Mm -hmm. um, but if you go online, you, you know, you'll get people who are taking fo more photos in the house than they've ever done before. We've got dusty houses, guys. I hate to break it to you. Um, unless, your, unless your house is like a, a factory for producing computer hard drives where it's a complete air filtration system, you're going to have dust because you're going to have flaky skin that's going to drop off. And when you're putting up photos online and saying, you know, is this an orb? Sadly, you'll get some people who will go, yeah, you've got a spirit there. I, you know, here's a photo. What do you see in this photo? And people will turn around and go, oh, I see something very dark. And I've actually kind of got really quite narky with people that say that they see something dark in it just from a photo mm. because you're actually sowing some really quite dangerous stuff into somebody's head if they feel that they've got a demonic presence in there. That can set off all sorts of psychosis problems. So, you know, I would just say get to know your house better. Um and just accept the creaks and bangs for what they are, just creaks and bangs. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. yeah, I think that's definitely something, Paul. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll just agree. Um, I, I think now more people are obviously staying in, indoors, you know, as you said, they're, they're noticing more and more what they would class as activity because they've watched these ghost programs on TV. Yep. You know, and there, there seems to be more and more popping up every day. <laughs> All doing the same sort of stuff. And yeah, it's nothing. getting a bit boring, to be honest. <laughs> I, Come on, we need honest, a different format. I had to watch hundreds of hours of these programmes, purely for research yeah. purposes, of course. Of course you did. It's the most haunted uh, phenomena. Um, they created a, a monster in the paranormal field, most haunted. So on one hand, it was good. But on the other hand, not quite so good, because we still follow that format, don't we, in the, in the field? Yeah. Um, and for me now, I prefer the, the talking heads, the storytelling, mm -hmm. the things like haunted hospitals and that. The You know... You'll look at it and you've got to realise that the, the dramatisations are what they are, dramatisations. Mm. But the stories are still really interesting. So, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things where you look and, and I've picked out a few that I have for my little Facebook group and we kind of, I'll throw up a video and we'll talk through it and what is going on here. And I'll pick out one or two that are particularly where you're going, this cannot be a demon in a modern day sense of the word. Mm. Um because actually, what are the fruit of it? The fruit are actually somebody's healed. Somebody's been saved from a bad accident. Somebody has been able to find something that they weren't able to find and live a better life as a result of it. Mm. Um, so therefore, I, you know, I like those kind of programs rather than the running around with a shaky camera. Um, yeah. Because I'm just going, actually, guys, how many hundreds of thousands of budget have you got? You could buy so many cameras, have three locked off cameras in one room. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you've got the ability to do infrasound readings now. You could do in pressure readings outside the building and in so you can see whether the doors are opening or not because of wind. There's so much you could do, but that would be really boring, wouldn't it? <laughs> You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't be screaming your head off. Yeah, you wouldn't be riveted to the screen watching somebody run out of a room. They, they would still be accused of um, faking evidence as well because, you know, with, with it being on the telly, you've got the added addition of being able to edit. Yes. And when you have, like, four or five cameras, you don't, you don't know. You're taking their word for it that they're all in sync. And it's well, live. Well, there's that. Yeah, and you've also got these ones that say that they're live, but they're not. Mm -hmm. And then you've got exactly. uh, things like uh, Mary Loves Dick. Which is in a, a, uh, <laughs> My favourite in, in a live reading, uh, a <laughs> live it. broadcast. 
<laughs> so, you know, and, and how much did he get? Was it 20 quid he got for saying that? Um, you know, you can find the YouTube video on it. Yeah, it's oh, uh, I actually remember watching that episode. <laughs> I think we all watched it with oh, our, our mouths wide open going, I can't believe he's saying that. And it, yeah. well, anyway, that, that's a whole different story. Yeah. Uh, there is a yeah. very famous, um, I say very famous because I'd not heard of it until I looked at your website, <laughs> um, poltergeist case that you personally have done quite a lot of research on, a very, very thorough research, I would say, even going back to the original letters that this this uh, particular case entailed, which was the Epworth poltergeist, which involved a mm-hmm. Christian family, didn't it? Yes, so the, the very famous Wesley family uh, for the Methodists. Um, yeah, so I, this is at the beginning of lockdown where I'm thinking, what the heck do I do? I'm being furloughed as a teacher, um, as a supply teacher. So I literally had nothing to do. And I thought I need to do something productive and hence I produced the website Um, and one of the stories that I got um, when I went to visit Epworth Rectory about eight, eight, nine years ago with my wife uh, I picked up a little booklet called the Epworth Poltergeist um, that was the account by Samuel Wesley Um, and it was just a side on my bookcase and I just picked it out one day and looked at it and went, actually, I could do something on this. So I used all of the research strategies that I'd done um, when I'd been doing my dissertation and my master's, and I applied them to the Epworth Poltergeist. So I was literally going back to the source materials, finding the earliest stuff that I could, analysing when dates were, when things were happening. I tried to put it in a chronological order. Oh, sorry to apologise. Okay. My dog's decided to discuss things. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> Lay down. We don't need your input. Okay. Lay down. Okay, I think we're safe. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. <clears throat> yeah. So I went through all of the, the original letters, uh, when they were dated, who they were from and to, and tried to put them in a chronological order of the, the events, which I don't think anybody's actually done um before they basically relied heavily on wesley's samuel wesley's report which was 70 years later um so i thought well there's going to be a lot of embellishment and when you look at this stuff there is a lot of embellishment that he's added to this stuff a lot of bravado when he confronts the poltergeist Mm -hmm. um that's not in the original letters now that's not to say it didn't happen but we just can't say that happened originally um and so i just went and produced a series looking through the actual floor plans you see this this is where most haunted came in really handy because floor plans feature heavily in a lot of ghost programs nowadays yeah yeah. so i thought let's let's have a look at this and also to be fair that Osborne world of the strange ghost book also has some floor plans (laughs) that show people walking through (laughs) where the new wall's been put in um and so I thought, well, let's look at the floor plans. Now, it's locked down. Etworth Rectory's closed. I can't go in there and take photos or anything like that. So I had to do a bit more scouting around on the internet. And I found an English heritage had done a wood, bear, um, a wood core samples, uh, for tree ring analysis mm-hmm. on the timbers. And they produced a, a floor plan of the, the place. So I was able to use that. And then by reading through the letters carefully... You can actually see the the flow of the people as they move around the building at various times uh, when certain incidents happen. And you can also say, well, actually, it's pretty sure that there's a door that should have been here. It looks like in this modern day thing, it's been blocked up. Um, And so you can actually then work out, well, what was going on? Where were the people when these incidents were happening? And... You look at it and think, maybe there was something happening and maybe there was some of the kids were playing around with stuff. Uh, And maybe, I mean, this is my own pet theory, there might have been a little bit of an illicit love affair going on between one of the daughters and uh, the the best man, as it were, of um, the father, the the butler, as it were. Mm. It could be, it might not be, but... You know, I kind of put hypothesis out there and test the evidence against it. 
And that is exactly how you should research a case. Go back to the alpha source, which is the original letters that you're able to get your hands on. And actually look at the alpha source and break it down and, and do the work. If you've got a case, do the work. You know, if you're looking at any form of case, you have to go back to the alpha source as far back as you can to that point and do the work, do the research. Have you got any tips for people in the in the modern ghost hunting world um, that might give them a better insight into their investigations? Um, know your equipment. Know the limitations of it. Know the history of the place as best as you can. Don't think you know everything. Do try and build a network of people who are specialists in their field um, that you can call on to analyse various bits of data. Um, go in expecting nothing to happen. And if something does, well, okay. Um, don't stir stuff up because you don't know what you're messing around with. Um, nobody does and uh, test everything be aware of your own psychological makeup as well what your line sides are have somebody there who will be a total skeptic who will ask you those difficult questions that you might go actually we've not thought of that we need to we need to address that uh, problem in the data um, that's kind of how I would go through with that sort of stuff. And, you know, don't be afraid to ask a spiritual person, um, even somebody, if, if you need something that is, is causing an issue to someone, you can go to a local vicar, and that vicar might be able to point you on if the case is, needs to go a bit further. Um, or they might be able to come and just say a prayer with a person. Um, never, never say to anybody that this is definitely haunted, because you can't say 100% for sure that it is. There might be information that you don't know about, and try and bring peace to a place rather than just go in for evidence. Because if you're just going in to try and find evidence of the afterlife, you might hurt somebody in the process. Very well said. Now, several times throughout this um, interview, you've you've talked about um, know who you are and whose you are. Um, teachings from the Christian um, belief system. How or what advice would you give somebody to to reach that point within themselves? Um, so, the, the, I mean, I, I'm coming from the Christian tradition, so things like meditation. Um, would help you to know who you are. It would help you to be able to shut down certain bits of you, that, especially the ego, and try and listen to that voice that comes from within. Um, for me, that would be the voice of God speaking, um, because God lives within each of us. Um, you know, I'm trying to. I'm using Christian terminology. You know, we, we've got all our own words for this. Mm -hmm. um, but also know who you are, uh, whose you are, because you are a child of the eternal God uh, who loves and cares for you and isn't a killjoy. OK, so expect you to have fullness of life. And so therefore, some things might be off limits because they can actually be either physically or mentally, emotionally, or whatever, damaging to us further down the line. We can get trapped in certain ways of thinking that are harmful to ourselves. So anything that really is not giving you life in all its fullness isn't what God's plan is for us. So therefore, just, just be aware and listen. I mean, even today, just 10 minutes, just light a candle and just be silent. The power of silence has spoken to everybody. And God speaking, and we're just so busy with our lives, we just can't hear that. And, you know, that protection that we get when we are going to areas that are disturbed, I would say. And I don't mean that necessarily in a bad way, but just 
where there's something happening, for me, I would I would not go in there without some sort of form of prayer. Mm-hmm. And I would say that would be um, in regards to internal examination <clears throat> as well as external, because there are parts of your brain that are disturbed that you would mm-hmm. need to go and examine that but you still need to do that with protections in place, your own personal protections and boundaries. And, you know, um, that that's just as relevant um, as well yes. as externally disturbed places. Um, mm-hmm. That's just something I would, would advise anybody. Definitely, definitely. We are, we are more than just our conscious selves. And our unconscious can be quite a weird, if not quite disturbing place Mm -hmm. Paul yeah I'm bringing you in at this point um how are you feeling now about um uh the Christian belief system in regards to the paranormal um I mean I've got my own faith and I believe certain aspects I mean I don't believe all of everything that went on in the bible but then I don't I mean like like you, I, I sort of question everything. Um, yeah, I, I just, I don't know, I just have my own belief and it doesn't always tally up with what other Christians believe. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's just my personal opinion. I don't um, believe but, everything that a lot of other Christians believe either. <laughs> so yeah, we're in the same exactly, boat there. Like, when, when it comes to like ghosts and, you know, looking at paranormal investigations and stuff that I've done, I I never, like you said, I've never said, oh, this place is haunted. Mm-hmm. It's more of a case of there's something going on here I can't explain. Mm. Yeah. And just because I can't explain it doesn't mean to say that Joe Bloggs, five years down the line, can't, oh, he'll, he'll come out with another explanation. So it is just, it's stumped me for the moment, you know, and that's it. I mean, I, I can't, there, there have been things I can't explain. Like, for example, that mobile phone experiment that we've talked about before. Yeah. You know, that that was totally blown my mind, and I can't figure out what what that was. Um, yeah, it, it was just really weird, because what we'd done, we um, had a mobile phone, and we phoned up someone else's phone on the investigation and put their phone in an empty room. Um, what we got back on the other phone was basically someone watching the telly in that room. We actually worked out that the film they were watching was Night of the Demon. <laughs> okay. And as we was talking to him, it was like saying, hello, what's your name? Are you, like, are you there? Sort of thing. It would actually give us answers as well. We okay. asked it to turn the telly down. It turned the telly down. But it, the, the telly was as clear as day. Mm-hmm. And, so no, what Paul did was he actually tracked back the time of the investigation as to what was streaming on all the the relevant TV programs at the time to see if there was interference and mm-hmm. that that particular film had been had it been on the TV at the yeah, time. Yeah. No, yep. it wasn't. The, the investigation took place um, at the uh, end of last year, not last year, 2018, I think, and. Um, the the movie was last played on terrestrial TV, 2010. And there was no way of connecting up any... No, I even contacted no. the phone company that I of my phone company and asked their tech guys, you know, is there any way that it could be interfered with? And they're like, without substantial equipment, no. But the world rem- is stranger than we think. It is very yeah. strange, but we haven't closed but, the door on that and said that's no, paranormal. No, we've, exactly. we've exactly we've left that door open, and it, you know, as we come across various people and and new technology and stuff like that, we're looking and still seeing if we can explain that. You know, yeah. it, it's a, and that's actually the whole lesson of today's show, is regardless of your belief system, be aware of that belief system. But be aware within that you have to remain open-minded and constantly examine it like Matt does with the Christianity belief he's got. He's looking at those scriptures and taking those and trying to understand those and bring some form of sense to it in a modern perspective. 
um, which brings lessons within itself and applying it to other areas and bringing those areas into his paranormal experience in his own right, right? Isn't that what we do? Mm-hmm. We bring lots of different threads in. It's called the chimera of the paranormal. I've written a blog on this recently. <laughs> I, I love that word. <laughs> The great word. It is a great word. Wow. So what's next for you, Matt? You're, you, you, this website is absolutely phenomenal. I'm loving, loving what you're, you're putting up there. What's next for you? Oh, how long is this lockdown? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I mean, to be honest, next for me is go for and have a pint with my friends at the pub. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's all I'm focusing on at the moment. Um, so I've got some more material that I've got to um, write up. Uh, from research so that's going to kind of be more to do with things like demon and legion and legion actually not being non-human beings but actually human beings um human spirits uh within the gadri and demoniac so i've got a lot of stuff that was to do with my dissertation still to put up there um but then there's things like uh, networking with more people um there's i i as I said before, I'm the editor of the Christian Parapsychologist Journal, so I, I kind of am work involved in that more. There's uh, conferences that I'm speaking at, um, organising uh, the Midlands Deliverance Forum, um, that sort of stuff. Um, so when lockdown finally, finally finishes, I might actually go out and um, just listen and see what's out there. I mean, this is part of my role, really, is just listening to what's out there in the popular culture, but also listening to where where where's God moving in people's lives, uh, mm-hmm. even though they might not call him God. Um, but also, where where are things happening that need a gentle touch to to bring some healing and wholeness? That's that's my my ambition, really, is to just bring in healing and wholeness to people and to places that are disturbed. Oh, that's really lovely, actually. Mm. That's really lovely. I love that. Thank you. Tell everybody where they can find your work, Matt. Um, so my God, Ghouls and Ghosts. Uh, sorry, Ghouls... <laughs> <I can't remember. laughs> What's Ghost, your website, love? Yes, 3G. Uh, ghostschoolsandgod.co.uk um, is my paranormal side of the things i have another one which is writings that i do with a lot of the uh, the pagan side of things which is um god of green and um we have a facebook group for ghost schools and god as well um and a page and um yeah that's where i am really fantastic Thank you so much for joining us today and discussing many various aspects of the paranormal, not just the Bible perspective. I'm sure at some point you're going to join us back on the show um, to do, you know, to probably delve into a more specific area. Um, because when we delve into these sort of things, we, we, we recognise our weaknesses, don't we, Paul? Absolutely, yeah. We can't know everything, can we? No, no. Nobody can. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can know everything. No, and when you look at, um, like, you know, the Bible and the paranormal phenomena, you soon understand it's so immense that there's so much. And many, many times on many topics, we come back to these kind of phenomena that have occurred and have been recorded and written down um, for ancient years. And it it's a, a lifetime study, just one particular area, as Matt can verify. It. It's not a five-minute job. It's not a five-minute internet search. This is a lifetime study in one specific area. And the paranormal is filled with so many different areas. And it crosses over into so many different other areas as well. It's just, it, that, that side of it never ceases to amaze me. It's important to remember human factor in all of this and our inherent ability to categorise and put things in boxes, yet remain open-minded and Never, ever think you're an expert on the subject. On that note, thank you so much for joining us, Matt. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. And we're going to end the show on that. So say good night, Paul. Good night. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>